Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Forecast is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Forecast is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly, all streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. What sort of future do you think we're heading for? How will we live as we slip into the 21st century? Welcome to Forecast, episode 95. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Scott Johnson. And once again, we meet Scott Johnson on the field of battle to right. wrestle with o the future. Only two will stand, those being our guests. And we are five episodes away from the fabled 100th episode where we really have nothing fancy planned other than a good show. And maybe balloons. Mm -hmm, They're actually maybe. not planned. If people are nice, maybe balloons. Maybe balloons, if you're good. Uh, joining us for episode 95, Mr. Chris Luckhart, photographer, podcaster, and Drupal website developer. He's a renaissance man. Uh, yes, yes. Thanks for uh, having me on the show. Thanks for being with us, Chris. Also, Eric Portalance, uh, digital strategist by day, co-host of Attention Surplus by Night, and very forgiving about my mangling of his last name. Welcome to the show, Eric. That's, uh, that's all right. Thanks for having me on. Uh, he's used to it, you can tell. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. I uh, appreciate you uh, showing up, too. And uh, let's start off with a prediction from one of our listeners. This comes from Shane, who says, when most people think of Terraform, they have Mars, Venus, or some other planet in mind. However, my prediction is that the first planet humanity will terraform will be Earth. As global warming grows increasingly more perilous, removing greenhouse gases from our atmosphere will become exponentially more profitable, probably with help from grants and subsidies from governments worldwide. Research and development into the capture and disposal of CO2 and methane will skyrocket. Vast fields of greenhouse gas traps will be constructed using renewable fuels such as solar and wind power that will break CO2 apart into harmless carbon and O2 gas, which is then released back into the atmosphere. Methane, the more dangerous greenhouse gas, can be burned for energy it yields co2 which can then be destroyed as described oh so renewable uh it's kind of a renewable plan this is interesting because um i when i picture terraforming tom i picture giant you know walker machines you know jamming drills into the into the hard brown earth of some planet we haven't hit yet and and having that somehow create something more even the star trekian view of sort of a genesis machine that would turn a world into an inhabitable place for human beings. His idea is uh, probably a little more practical. I, I think I, I kind of like this. If it's, if it's at all affordable, this seems like a good tactic for, uh, for us as a people. Chris, what do you think of the idea of terraforming ourselves? <laughs> well, it does make sense. We would start with something close to home, right? So, um, I, I, you know, the whole concept of Rathacon kind of terraforming is way off, but uh, we're we're kind of headed in that direction where we're going to need uh, uh, you know some kind of solution to our problems down here in terms of uh, you know all the environmental issues and, and all that kind of thing. So it makes sense, yeah. It, th this is kind of the optimistic version of terraforming. I, I kind of, when I think of terraforming Earth or even on another planet, I'm kind of thinking of the Wally -E view of just this like wasteland that we're kind of uh, manipulating for some kind of profit, but. Uh, but not necessarily uh, from a renewable energy perspective. So I'm thinking that, yeah, maybe we will terraform Earth, but it's not going to be necessarily in, in the, uh, the same way as the, uh, the listener. Plus, I think the term, doesn't terraform mean to form like the terrain? <laughs> I mean, I'm no linguist, so I don't know where this came from, but it seems like that means we got to like, you know, turn the Earth into something. And this, this is mm -hmm. a little bit different than that. So I don't know if he's got the right terminology for it, but I do like the idea that we could finally figure out a way to capture the crap we're, we're putting out and renew it or destroy it or at least separate it and make it so this place is a little more livable and we'll have less predictions about how we need to hurry up and get to Mars or hurry up and get to the moon or colonize, colonize other planets simply because we've sort of destroyed things. Population's a different issue, but I don't know, Tom, I don't want to be forced out simply because we're a bunch of pigs. Well, maybe terraforming would be the best then. We just wipe slate clean. You know, send start over. Send the population up into orbit for a little while while everything gets settled down. We Give just, Kansas some mountains, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, why not? We've <laughs> yeah. been without mountains for so long. They've been so good. They deserve mountains. <laughs> 
All right, send us Who should your we take mountains away from? Uh, well, is, do we have to take mountains away, or can everybody have mountains? Well, uh, is that, that like everybody winning in somewhere. soccer? And, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's sort of like mountains are less special if everybody's got them. Well, they're like, uh, I remember in the game, I hate to bring up games here, but in the game um, uh, Spore, you had a limited number Especially of doohickeys you could, you could put on your dude, right? So you couldn't put 50 years on them. You could only put 10 or whatever. You had kind of a, you kind of have a, 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 an economy of how many sort of appendages you could put on that thing. So I don't think it'll, uh, hopefully it won't work where it's like, all right, well, Kansas, if you really need two more mountains, we're going to have to talk to the Appalachia people or the Rocky Mountain people and get this deal done. Uh, I, I hope it doesn't turn into that. That would be terrible. Let's hope we can all just pick the terrain we want, pick the weather we want, and then start fresh. I'm down with that. Sanctions. Well, you know, the other option is terraforming internally, where you, uh -huh. you go into a world like Tron or something along those lines. Where I, I remember reading a book years ago. I, unfortunately, I can't re recall the title of it at the moment, but um, humans essentially destroyed the planet and went underground, and they essentially terraformed down below. Um, and work that way. And then right. you, there's also, like I was saying with Tron, you can terraform internally. And, uh, you know, whether you end up in micro trips or not, it's a whole other uh, conversation, I suppose. But um, that, that's maybe one other approach. All right. Send us your predictions, folks. Join in on the fun. Email forecastpodcast at gmail.com uh, or post your uh, comments up at forecastpodcast.com. That's our blog. Works on the blog if you spell it either way. In the email, you need to spell it F O U R cast podcast at gmail.com time for some short-term predictions and uh, eric we'll start with you this is something that you think will happen sooner rather than later what do you have so this isn't going to surprise chris because he knows that i'm a, a keen observer of apple so i was thinking of taking something that uh, i've been thinking about lately uh, especially following the iCloud launch and the iPhone 4S launch, uh, which is two areas that I think that they may move into from a, a technology perspective. The first is we keep talking about this idea of mobile payments that we're going to be using our phones to, to pay for everything from, from groceries to dry cleaning in the future. Um, and, and, you know, it feels like we're a step closer to that. So um, I was thinking that this, this whole uh, Cards app thing that they have is kind of the first step to using your your Apple ID, which you know used to be your iTunes account, to to pay for for physical objects, and the next step is really to use your phone to do that in the real world, and everything is linked through your your uh, your Apple ID account. Um, and it seems like if they can cut out companies like Visa and Mastercard, that there's huge amounts of money to be made there. Um, kind of like what I guess uh, Square App is doing with their their uh, their uh, magnetic card reader that they have for the iPhone and stuff. Uh, so that was the like first thing. Oh, I was just going to let me throw this in real quick, but I noticed yeah. that it seems like Square is going about the business that some big company is going to come and yank their their cord and and be the thing that they they aren't big enough to be. Do you do you side with that? That they're 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 really innovating in some really cool ways, but it seems like others, maybe Apple, maybe somebody else, is either going to swoop in, buy them up, or completely put them out of business <clears throat> simply because they have more resources and more money. Yeah, it's kind of a stopgap solution. Like the whole idea of magnetic strips on our credit cards seems like something that, that can't last for more than another 10 years. We're already starting to have chips built into it and, and, uh, and, and RFID chips and things like that. So um, it seems like the idea of putting a magnetic uh, swiping reader on my phone is, is just kind of the intermediary until we actually get chips built into it to do that. And, and whether Square owns that, um, you know, probably not just because... You know, I, I'm sure the cell phone uh, carriers and the the mobile carriers and uh, you know the the visas and banks of the world are going to be fighting for that too, and they've got a lot more resources. I wonder Absolutely. if uh, if Apple is going to get cooperation enough to make that happen because it all makes sense on the consumer end, right? I'm already using it that way, so why not just use it for everything? Uh, but I don't know what the payment structure is on the back end, but I do know that Visa and MasterCard and all of those payment systems are, are putting putting their weight behind things from other payment providers. There's the ISIS system from the carriers. There's Google Wallet. Uh, there's, there's lots of others right now because they want to get a chunk of it. And Apple has at least already made one misstep by saying, well, you have to go through our in-app payment system and we get 30% of everything or you don't get to use it at all. And the reaction has been for most major apps to just take away their stores and not use mm -hmm. that in-app payment system. 
The, the whole, yeah, that's an interesting one, the, the in-app payment, because it feels like the Amazons and, and Kobos and, and everybody who's selling eBooks uh, in the world would be okay with them taking a fee along the lines of what credit card processors take, which sure. is two to 4% usually, but 30% just seems ridiculous for a, a service fee like that. So uh, let me, let's throw it uh, over to you, Chris. I, this idea of um, micropayments is a cool idea anyway, but I, I want to kind of know maybe what's your take on the idea of how we'll pay for them. So for just a second, forgetting about who pays who and who controls the market, do you want to be able to walk through a store and have it go boop, boop, and recognize your phone's in your pocket? Or do you want to have to pull it out, tap some stuff, sign up, fake little credit card thing on the screen? Like, what is your ultimate, you know, what do you, where do you see the end game for that? Uh, I like to have as much control as possible over what's happening with my money. So just having uh, an automatic detection doesn't really sit well with me. Uh, I like... I know it takes a little extra time, but for me, dealing with money and, and that kind of thing, it uh, I, I like having that extra layer of personal security, I guess, if you will, to watch all of the transactions happen. So uh, that's kind of my take on it, I guess. I, I think uh, most people will feel that way, but I wonder if they'll yeah. act that way. You know what I mean? Uh, where if they build some system where you have to review your, your payments before you walk out of the store or it will automatically charge it if you get too far away, right? It'll track you. If you get to your car, it goes ahead and just processes the payments without your review. I think a lot of people will just start trusting it. Uh, yeah. And just, you know, the same way they don't really pay attention when the grocery store clerk is ringing stuff up. They just kind of, you know, assume it's all right at the end. Uh, they don't they don't check every item to make sure that it got rung up at the right price. I, I think that that same mentality will probably hold. You know, there'll be people like you who are going to be like, no, I don't trust this and I'm going to watch every time. But it might not become the norm. Well, it's interesting. Know, I was thinking about this thing. To, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say to contradict myself a little bit. Uh, when, when I go into an Apple store and they give me the, the choice of just getting an email receipt versus, you know, a, a printed receipt there, uh, I actually do kind of like that. It, it does speed things up a little bit, although I do check and make sure, of course, because that's just the way I am about it. Uh, but um, it, it's nice to just think, okay, yeah, I got an email. Great. That's good enough. So yeah. I, I suppose in a way I, I'm uh, resistant to a degree, but um, I'm probably more on the side of resisting than uh, most people will be because if it's easier and you think it's secure enough and after a while um, uh, uh, it just it becomes sort of uh, common sense and, and just easy enough, then yeah, I suppose it does uh, work that way. Yeah, and I, I was gonna, the only thing I was going to interject is I picked up an iPhone, or iPhone 4S this weekend and um, I, it, for whatever reason, it got in my head or I was reminded of way back when, when texts were, the, were, were new, when SMS was a thing that didn't exist before and suddenly came on the scenes with mobile phones. And I remember a lot of people freaking out about, well, I don't want to send that text is going somewhere. I don't want people to see what I'm saying to my friends. And that's a huge invasion of privacy. And we've had so many little incremental changes where people have become completely accepting of that stuff to the degree that now I'm literally saying a sentence. I, I said word for word into a uh, device whose software is now taking that, translating it so it is now text. It sent it to a server. It sent it back. I'm, I'm maybe chewing somebody out. It's, it's all there for the record. Um, I feel like the, I'm kind of with Tom. I feel like there's initial resistance, there always is. But then eventually, resistance is futile uh, in a way. And, we're all and we all sort of embrace it because you said it best, Chris, when people become comfortable with the security level of it, that's something that they are okay, you know, okay with. And the convenience level pushes them right over the edge. And I, I feel like, you know, for sure with these kinds of things, with this kind of payment stuff, the only reason we haven't seen it sooner, I believe, is because we haven't gotten to that security level yet. But when we do, and I think we're close, you know, I think Eric's prediction pushes us right off the edge. We're good to go. Good prediction, Eric. And there, there's no reason that we couldn't, you know, basically tap your phone and then you put a PIN number on your phone or, or even sign your name with your finger. Uh, like all the same security measures that we have in place right now are, are pretty much the same when it comes to, to mobile payments like this. So I don't think I'm really concerned about security and, and how many people do we know anyway that have had their, uh, have had false transactions go through on their credit cards and things like that uh, with the current technology. So it's not like we're that secure right now. Yeah, exactly. Any, I, I, here in the United States, I, I know it's, it's a little rarer uh, sometimes elsewhere, especially uh, in, in Canada, where they actually bring you the, the device to swipe your credit card yourself. In the United States, it's more common still for the restaurant to take your credit card, walk away with it where you can't see what they're doing with it. And we trust that. 
uh, and it doesn't lead to widespread mass insanity. So um, that, that's a good point. All right, let's go over to you, Chris, for your short-term prediction, uh, something that you think will maybe happen in the next few years. What do you have for us? Okay, well, this is actually a little more simpler um, and kind of uh, speaks to my practice as a web developer. Um, I'm thinking in terms of with uh, the, the emergence of, of really good voice commands like Siri uh, and so on, where you'd be able to do um, a voice command, like a voice commanded uh, Squarespace style thing. So the way with, with people who aren't familiar with Squarespace, you can click and drag uh, any element on a web page that you're designing and it just kind of moves into place and boom, it's there. And that in its own way is has been sort of revolutionary in the last few years. But I'm thinking where you can actually say, instead of having to type these things out and go, well, I need, you know, two pixels of space on the left side and, and you know, kind of move it over manually that way and then refresh your browser and check it, where you can just say uh, the command to your computer and just say, uh, move uh, block X two pixels to the right, and it just does it. So it could speed up web development and uh, design like that. Uh, I, you know what, you're dead on. It's way Star trek -y. It's like one of the new Star Trek things we're about to get. Uh, where yeah. we can tell the computer to do the stuff we need it to do to make these refinements. And I had an experience, again, with my iPhone over the weekend. Uh, Brian Ibbett of, of Coverville fame is flying here. Was it the, was it over here at the house? We were here for a conference over the weekend. And he grabbed my phone and, as a joke, turned on the Siri thing and said, please set an alarm starting at 2 a.m., have it go off every five minutes, disable the snooze, and have it end at 6 a.m. That was the sentence. He literally said all of those relatively complex things. And I... I'm not trying to overbloat Siri, but it did it. It did all those alarms. It disabled Siri's great for everything. with a practical joke. <laughs> right, it really is. And and I and I in my in my head I went, oh man, this is just a step. It's another step, and other phones and Android's got some cool stuff. Some other apps that do this, but it's a step toward that thing where natural language, regardless of your accent or your um, uh, just whatever, maybe the the way your voice sounds compared to somebody else's, isn't really a factor anymore. And we finally kind of reached some parity with that. And then the next step really is all of this stuff, all the things we do, you know, forget about touch, forget about, you know, mice, forget about the traditional input methods. I really believe that there's a huge place for voice activated stuff in the future. Now you bring up that age old thing. Well, what if it, you know, you don't have a voice box, you were injured or you had cancer and lost your throat or, you know, there's all these go those kinds of questions. We always have to keep accessibility at the forefront of all this, but. I can I can tell you this your your prediction and that kind of stuff is endlessly fascinating to me. Uh, Were you able Eric, to you tell think? Siri undo what Ibit just did? <laughs> I did. I was able to go in and say <laughs> cancel previous something. I can't remember exactly what I said, and it did. I got rid of it, which is nice. But it literally put all these reminders in there, just like all through the night till six a.m. And oh. had I forgotten, of course, I'd have been up every you know ten minutes. It would have been great, but it was pretty funny. And you can go manually do it, of course, but. You know, it just got you thinking. It's uh, you know, I feel like you know Chris's prediction sort of you know put put a little flame on that fire for me today. Yeah, you know, one thing about you're talking about uh, uh, different languages and so on with with how this will work. One thing uh, that kind of caught my attention with doing web design is HTML by its nature is generally English in its nature, right? So uh, it's uh, it would be easy enough, I think, to kind of go in that direction to get those commands in there. Um, and just say, you know, move elements around or, or whatever it is. Actually, I'd like a Siri command that says uh, where you could tell when server goes down, fix it. Right. That would be really helpful for me. And it yeah. just goes through and does all the things that you would be doing in, in a troubleshooting yeah, yeah. tree. That's yeah. I would hope that command also worked on its own servers when those are down. That's just a side my, note. My frustration with Siri particularly is that it worked just fine on my iPhone 4 until they decided to make it the central version of the iPhone 4S, and then they disabled the app on the iPhone 4. <laughs> that's just a bunch of crap. That's, that's faking it. It's not a special feature of the iPhone phone. 4S. It's a feature that worked just fine on the iPhone 4. Anyway. That's true. But but the integration with like third party APIs and stuff, that's all very exciting. You wouldn't have had that otherwise. But yeah, it's a little stinky that you couldn't use it as a standalone app after that point. Yeah, um I Eric, saw, go ahead. There was a uh there was this webcomic I was looking at as far as uh Siri pranks and it basically was two guys talking and the first guy says, "Hey, check out my new iPhone 4S. I've got Siri on it." So he says Siri, and the other guy says email folder title pornography to mom. So <laughs> I think we'll see some, <laughs> some, uh, some interesting Siri pranks. Thankfully, you can't email so, folders from iOS. That's so true. I think, I think what we're getting at here is April 1st is going to be a nightmare for people with uh, iPhone 4S. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Sounds like. What do you, uh, Eric, what's your take on the future of voice activated lifestyle technology and whatnot? I think I'm excited by it so long as it's accomplishing things that are easier to do with voice. I'm not sure that Chris's suggestion of moving pixels around a screen is necessarily the right metaphor to think about it. Um, that doesn't really seem a lot quicker or better, more efficient to me than it would uh, manipulating that with my, with my finger or, or mouse. Um, but I think some of the, the use cases that were being shown with Siri on the iPhone are, are truly remarkable. And, um, you know, it's this idea that maybe it's not just your phone. It's a, a kind of the, the Star Trek idea where you're walking around your house and you can just say a command at any moment and have your lights dim so you don't actually have to get up and, and do that or change the TV channel without having to use a, a really awfully designed remote um, those kinds of things are interesting, and, and certainly while driving as well, I think there's some interesting uh, technological applications there. Um, so I, I think we'll definitely see it a lot, and as um, you know, this technology gets better. And the cool thing is Siri is learning, and because it's all server-side, um, you know, they, they must be collecting this massive database of sure. things that people are asking of it, so they can become better at understanding the types of things that people want from their devices and, and make this better over time. So I think we'll see some interesting stuff out of that as well. Lots of people seem to want the folders of porn sent to their mothers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move to long-term predictions. And Chris, we'll start with you this time. Uh, these are more the in a hundred years we'll be in a flying car sorts of things. What do you, what do you got? Well, on the subject of flying, um, I think all of us have had at one time or another a flying dream. So uh, that just brought to mind the idea that perhaps within 100 years or whatever the time frame is, uh, we'll be able to get a device of some kind that isn't really visible that, uh, that would um, help us to defy gravity to a degree and give us maybe levitational properties. So I'm not talking about like gravity boots or a jetpack or so on. It would actually be just something that is almost imperceptible to when you're looking at somebody and it would give you the ability to maybe lift off a little bit and move around. Uh, I'm not sure what the practical application of that would be. Obviously, speed, uh, being able to, you know, get around faster or whatever the case may be, or mobility uh, issues even there. So uh, that's uh, kind of what I had in mind. So something that would uh, control atmospheric conditions directly around you, in other words, manipulate your, I mean, because you wouldn't yeah, like be able to change gravity. You'd have to fight gravity to change it. Well, um, yeah, and so, using gravity yeah. as an easy access uh, way to kind of understand my point. Um, I guess, yeah, you'd have to create, I don't know, of some version of a warp shell, if, if you want to go with a Star Trek metaphor, and it yes. would allow you to, to move around and lift off uh, the ground. And, and, yeah, I mean, the instant thing I think of uh, as I'm processing this more in my, my mind is uh, how it can help uh, people who are disabled. I don't know what will happen in 100 years with that whole uh, topic right there, but... Um, you know, mobility uh, for people who, you know, are kind of uh, lacking in that area, it could be a real benefit, I suppose. I uh, Just to throw it out real quick, and, and then we'll, I'd really like to hear what Eric's take on, is on this, but uh, we had a recent experience. My wife had some, some relatively minor surgery, but the first few days uh, she was told, you know, don't move around a lot. If you go to a store or something, get in a, one of those wheelchair things, you know, little carts, ride around in that, just be real careful. She's 100% better now, so anyone wondering, she's great now, but... Uh, we go to a Walmart because we got to get a prescription. We're on, a, on our way home from the, from the hospital, picking up the meds that they prescribed for. And she got into one of those little carts and is driving it around. And it is, even for me, who's not in the cart, it is shocking to your system how less than normal you feel when you're in one of those carts. I never really appreciated it before, but the looks on people's faces, they look all put out if you're in front of them. You know, they kind of have to kind of make a wider berth around people to make sure they're not bumping into you or whatever. It's kind of terrible, like the way human beings that are fully bodily able are able to see that and go, oh, my, that, you know, I'm not going to be able to get over my, my six pack of Coke as fast as I would have because, you know, this old lady's in a cart or whatever. And it got me to thinking it would be really nice if some of that stuff would... You know, if we could figure out a technology to make it so that they could either float around at a speed that's normal, take up less bulky space. The, the best thing for me is essentially give them a way to walk in, in a very real way so that they're not being discriminated against in that way. And it's, it's not even the thing that's being said, but you see it in all their eyes and they're all staring. And she's just in this little cart trying to get around. I thought it was, 
it was really eye-opening eye for me. So. Oh, especially because your wife probably doesn't obviously look like she needs to be there, right? Right. And so right. they're they're like, oh, that lady, she's just taking <laughs> advantage. <laughs> 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 right, right, right. That's probably exactly it. When we got home, I'm like, how'd you feel about this? She goes, I hated that. I never want to do that ever in my life. Yeah. So, you know, we kind of have a, we now have a pact. <laughs> if either one of us gets in any kind of shape where we need, you know, a cart, we'll figure out something else because it's just miserable. So Chris or Eric, rather, what do you, what do you say to this idea that uh, in, the, in the future for, for disabled and otherwise folks, we'd be able to move around in a way that's, you know, gravitationally suspect. I think it would be an awesome way to get to work in the morning if you live on the if you're on the 15th floor of an office building. Forget the elevator; you just kind of shoot up the side of the building and into the floor. Um, <laughs> that could be fun. Um, it would it yeah, would help with falls cool. too, wouldn't it? Like falling out of stuff, you'd probably be safer. Oh I'm yeah, guessing. yeah, just like in, engage the gravitational field, so you'd get like I don't know. Uh, people jumping off buildings just for the fun of it and then slow themselves down <laughs> at the second floor or something. Um, be really quick exit to, to lunchtime. Um, yeah, I, I think and, this is cool. Lunch. There's so many situ... Sorry? <laughs> oh, and lunch. Yes. <laughs> like, there's so many applications of this that I can I, I think would be really cool on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, how many times do you walk down the street and you're stuck behind a group of slow walkers and you'd like to just propel yourself over top of their heads? Just leapfrog them. Um, that could be fun. You could also have some really cool extreme sports where uh, you, you kind of have this whole gravitational thing like, uh, I don't know, air, air soccer or something. Um, so, uh, yeah, this would, be, this would be awesome. Basically Harry Potter there, Tom, don't you think? Yeah, Quidditch matches will never be the same because you'll be mm -hmm. able to actually play on brooms in the air. <laughs> Just need somebody to invent a snitch or sneech. That's right. Or whatever that's, not, that's, uh, too, that would, that's crazy ass prediction, Dom. Come on. Yeah, we're, uh, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. We still need Eric's <laughs> long term prediction. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, real quickly, uh, Chris, I think if you could check your settings uh, and yeah. double check, make sure that your mic is actually what's feeding Skype and not your laptop mic. Because we're getting a little echo from you, and I kind of think that uh, might got to sound better. It, it could be from the room, actually. Okay. Um, well, if you yeah, just double I'm, check, I'm an and, IMAX, if, so and if, if you're set, okay. if you're set right, then yep. it's probably just the room. But all right, I'll take a look now. All right. Uh, and meanwhile, we'll go to Eric and uh, get your long-term prediction again, just sort of farther down the road, not in the near term. What what kind what kind of things do you see? I was thinking that one of the issues I always have is I have really bad memory, like selective memory, and I can't always remember the things that I want to remember. Um, and it, it seems kind of random. So I was thinking about our brains and how it stores information. Um, it seems to me that at some point in our lifetimes, I'm hoping, we'll have some kind of way of, of decoding this information and storing it in some other medium within a, a, some, you know, an equivalent of a computer hard drive so that we could actually play back or search through the archives of our lives that we've consumed at, at any given moment, um, even if we've forgotten that moment. So, you know, as we get older and, and some people are affected by Alzheimer's and things like that, that we could actually go in and, and if we're trying to remember something that we've done, we could actually search through and then find a record of that. And, and in some cases, if we have visual information recorded, we could actually go in and, and replay those memories. So forget camcorders, you've got a full visual record of your life. It's like the uh, Time Machine app. Yeah. yeah. Except for your brain. That's interesting because yeah. you, you would probably create more, uh, more functional, uh, you know, people that are dealing with Alzheimer's, late stage Alzheimer's would be a much more um, sort of functional piece of the fabric of society because Mm -hmm. Part of that horrible disease is that you don't know you've forgotten it or you just forgot it but didn't remember thinking you forgot. I mean, it's just this constant barrage of your brain misfiring and not doing what you think it's supposed to do. If you had a way to quickly and conveniently, maybe even with the help of others, say, no, 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 you know, this person you're meeting right now, you're not meeting for the first time. Let's go back. And it would be some sort of automated thing where it'd say, all right, well, that face shows up 15 years ago at that wedding. Bring it up. Oh, Yeah. You know, and bring these memories to the forefront. Uh, maybe that would, you know, maybe even aid in the treatment of that horrible condition. Um, I don't know, but uh, it seems it seems like maybe that's a step in the right direction. And the idea that I could just scrub through my memories would save me from everything. Forget about like to do lists and productivity software. I just go back two nights and see what I said, <laughs> and then just do it. 
Yeah, but you had to remember or, what, right. what, what night it was. Right. Yeah. Along the lines of what Tom was saying, the time machine app for your brain, maybe if uh, the last week of my life has been horrible, I could just go back a week and uh, forget all about it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> like really be able to restore? Yeah, restore. <laughs> restore my life to this day. From- I, I want to do over. <laughs> I like that. Restore brain from backup. <laughs> yeah. Restore before I went out to the bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do this no night hangover. over. Uh, mm-hmm. what, do you, what do you think of, uh, of this idea, Chris, that we'd, we'd you know, not only be able to move our brains into an external device, but we'd have archives of everything we experienced so we could kind of f- flash through them? Well, we're, we're almost kind of doing that already uh, with, uh, I liken it to how, Oftentimes, I find I don't remember things as much, and I don't even make the effort because I'll just think, well, I can go to Google for that. You know, to get back to the web stuff, um, if you think of, like, uh, attributes for HTML tags or, or uh, CSS things or JavaScript, um, I just I look that stuff up on the web. I've been doing that for a decade now where uh, I, I just I don't have to worry about remembering it. I don't even go to books. I just go to Google or whatever the case may be. So I, I'm kind of heading in that direction anyways, and whether I can like, um, you know, plug in a USB drive or something and, uh, and download some information so I can just take it out and open up some more storage, uh, you know, I, I suppose we're kind of headed in that direction. How do you feel about the, the ramifications of privacy on that sort of thing? We, we talked about that a little bit earlier, but the idea that would you, want, would you want assurance that only you could see your memories so that all the stuff you regret when you were in seventh grade or whatever, you could just, you know, nobody else could ever have access to that stuff? How important would that be? Um, maybe after I die, a trigger could be fired and it would open it up to the public because by that point, mm. I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, who know. cares then? Yeah, in a way, you know, I, I would definitely like to keep some things private, but uh, uh, there's a time and place where it could be opened up. You know, it'd be great if, if you go back in history and think of like Michelangelo or or Copernicus or, or any of those great figures, uh, it would be amazing to go back and open up their minds on a, a thumb drive or whatever the case is and just see what they were thinking at the time of their discoveries and, and their uh, experiments and so on. It would be maybe uh, they'd really have to, valuable maybe they'd have to. Maybe they would have to, before they die, they'd have to figure out a way to isolate the things they want to be public because you don't want to go back and go, uh, today I'm going to learn all about why Picasso, what his creative process was, yeah. what's going on. <laughs> Oh shoot! I'm here. I'm watching him kill a guy in Florence, and no one knew about that. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I worry about. I, I worry, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Is that it doesn't necessarily if the guy's long dead, it doesn't necessarily just affect them as a memory. It would affect those still around, the people who never found the guy Picasso killed. I'm using that's a terrible example, but you know what I mean. Why like, well, Picasso's a, a good Martin. example because he he led a, a fairly CV life as far as sure, yeah, yeah. Right? so so yeah that, right. that we, uh, makes sense for sure. It doesn't even but, have to be know, murder; it could just be something you didn't need to see. <laughs> well, I'm sure we all have thoughts that nobody else needs to see. I suppose so yeah. that that definitely harkens to the privacy uh, aspect of it. But uh, but yeah, the, the concept of downloading your memories it's it's great. Um, well, Gordon can, Bell. Uh, uh, what it would be. Gordon Bell is doing this, you know, not not on the level you're talking about, but he's he's attempting to record almost all of his experiences, and he's got an organization system for them, and it's more of a, it's not I mean, not performance art, but it's more of like a, a an experiment, uh, proving that this could be done and and what the advantages of it. He wrote a book called Total Recall, not the Philip K. Dick based movie, but the uh, it's a nonfiction book about you know basically life. Recording, life casting, uh, recording everything we do. I, I, I like this idea that, that Chris had about, you know, what do we do with this data after we die? And maybe there's a way to make it anonymous and turn it into this hive mind idea, like a database of all human knowledge that's anonymized that you could search through. And, and maybe there are links that you could make and, and things that you could learn about people that, that weren't necessarily public because they'd never been aggregated in that way. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. All right, uh, before we get to the crazy-ass predictions, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor, Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, which means you save time, money, and hassle. It's like a time machine. It's like the closest we can get to watching how people lived, you know, some kind of period piece or a sci-fi epic, maybe Tron Legacy, Mm. what it's like on that internal world we were talking about earlier. Check it out, netflix.com slash twit. Gives you a 30-day free trial. So if you're already watching Netflix movies, you already know how great it is. Uh, so tell a friend, netflix.com slash twit. If they're like, eh, I don't know if I want to try it out, tell them, look, you'll get, I'll give you 30 days free. 
and give him this address, netflix.com slash twit. We thank him for their support of Forecast. All right, let's start off with Eric on this one. Uh, one really far out there forecast, our crazy-ass prediction. What do you have for us, Eric? I, I played a lot of SimCity 2000 when I was younger, and I was ah, always fascinated by game. the... Mm -hmm. uh, so good, so good. Uh, and the end state, which were these arcologies that you unlocked, and there were like 10 of them uh, in the game, and you could just kind of place them as, as a reward. Did you ever do the um, entire city of arcologies? I did. Yeah, yes. yeah totally. <laughs> More that you just you know terraform everything yeah. to get back to what we were talking about, and just put arcologies arcologies everywhere. So I, I was thinking that um, my crazy future vision is that we all live in these arcologies, these massive uh, in, interior ecosystems uh, on other planets that have kind of the the perfect environment. I think Mass Effect, the video game, explored this a little bit with some of the the cities and things like that. Um, I guess it's maybe just uh, throwing back to this nostalgia that I had when I was younger playing these, this, this game, but uh, it always seemed like a really cool thing to me. Well, speaking of Mass Effect, um, they, do, they do a lot of... Now, for those who don't understand the, what, an arc, what an arcology is, and yeah. I'm not well suited to do this, but explain to people what, what it actually is so they can get a better feel for what you mean. So I think the word arcology comes from a mix of architecture and, and ecology. So it's basically a, a, you can think of it as a building that has a fully self-contained natural habitat on the inside. So it, it could be living quarters, um, it could be parks, it could be, you know, uh, all kinds of things. So uh, animals, humans uh, can, can potentially coexist within this environment. And so you don't necessarily need to have a perfect environment on the outside of it so long as everything inside is climate controlled and, and, and so it's, a, it's like a bio sort of a biodome sort of sort of concept where yeah, it's you, an entire ecology in a skyscraper all right that makes sense so if you so if you have um let's say we go to the moon and we now have a united moon colony right hey Tom? it's a great book on that <laughs> yeah um i hear you're doing a reading of that i'll have to hear about that later anyway um you go to the moon, you got those kinds of sort of that, that idea seems like that's how we colonize the moon. It isn't so much about let's go there and let's somehow get the moon so it has um, an, an, an atmosphere that sustains life or any of those sorts of things. Uh, not, we're not going to Genesis project it. We're going to go up there and we're going to put everything under domes or in buildings that are self-contained. Is that, do you feel like that's the future of our, not only existence here in the crazy ass future, but also as we move into the stars, do we do that same thing as we go out? I, th I think so. I think once you've perfected the arcology, how to make a perfect arcology, then the sky's the limit. And these things can be big enough that, that um, you know, you don't necessarily feel constrained by the environment. So you could potentially put these on any planet um, so long as you had a way of kind of sustaining that internal ecosystem in some way. So, I mean, I don't know that that's necessarily the future, but I think that... Um, you know, as we eventually deplete the resources on Earth, and, and no matter what we do, there will be a point, you know, thousands and thousands of years in the future, that, that the resources on this planet will be depleted, and there may be nothing that's really usable, uh, that we'll have to think of other ways to, to live in, in these types of habitats. Chris, what do you think about the, uh, the future of floating, self-contained cities, ships, housing units, whatever, that... that you know, you can have a big soccer field on the middle of your mothership. What do you think about that idea? <laughs> well, I can recall as a kid uh, uh, seeing on a cover of uh, probably Popular Science or Popular Mechanics, um, it was uh, uh, issues that my dad had. It was a, like a donut-shaped orbiting uh, space station, if, if you will. And inside it, it showed, um, it, it essentially looked like the inside of like an inner tube, and it was tr uh, transparent. And you could see... Uh, 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 communities, uh, forest areas, the whole works, the entire ecology of the planet. And something like that or something like a sphere on the moon makes uh, a lot more sense as a first step uh, as opposed to doing a complete terraforming of a, a moon or a planet or whatever. So it seems like a natural obvious step that is obviously way, way off. But, uh, but you know, that's the easy way to get our current existence into another place. So, and, and maybe even shorter term would be the concept of a building here on Earth that is completely, um, uh, an, uh, you know, uh, an arcology, as if you will. 
Um, mm-hmm. I, I fact, think, you know, sorry, go ahead, Eric. No, I was just going to say, I think that they're building one in, in Dubai or somewhere around there, something that's pretty similar to, an, to narcology right now. So it's not too far mm-hmm. off to have them on Earth, but maybe not on the scale that we're talking about. But I, I think this one that I was reading about had the capacity for 10,000 or 15,000 people to live in it. Um, so, so maybe we're not that far off as, as we think. Well, you know, I was going to say, uh, we are kind of progressing in that direction anyways, because you see these malls and, and, uh, um, for some reason I immediately think of the world trade center and how they had like an entire living space, um, not necessarily living quarters, but a place where you could function and go get, you know, food that you need, you go do your work and people would stay there overnight and, and all that kind of stuff. Even, uh, if you look at like Google headquarters where you can just do some work, get your food, crash overnight, and keep the cycle going, and you never leave the building. Um, you know, for short periods of time, you can exist like that. So we're kind of heading in that direction too, and in you know a much smaller scale, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're developing an arcology in Mazdar City near Abu Dhabi, uh, projected to house between forty-five thousand and fifty thousand inhabitants in a zero carbon, zero waste ecology. And I guess there's one uh, designed by Paolo Soleri being constructed in central Arizona called Arcosanti. Oh, wow. Field trip. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's load up the forecast bus. I, uh, don't they also have, um, there's some, some Japanese design that's supposed to, it's mainly for population management, but I think it's also features much of what we're talking about, which is that big, you know, constructed multi-layered city it would be sort of over Tokyo or over the, you know, the, the Sea of Japan yeah. and, um, and, and make a way for people to, to, to live and to work and whatever. It seems like, you know, all these things are in that same, that same thing. You know, all this would really maybe want to do is go watch Biodome with, um, with what's his name? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was his name all of a sudden. But, uh, yeah, you know, see it's Pauly Shore. Extreme. Pauly Shore, thank you very much. Yes. Sorry, I, I wish I didn't remember that. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I kind of do too. <laughs> we'll, we'll give you a chance to wipe it out of your brain now. We'll move to you for your awesome. crazy-ass prediction. Time frame doesn't matter, just make the leap. What do you have for us, Chris? Okay, well, maybe I could wipe it out of my brain with my prediction. Um, so I was thinking, uh, t- stereotypically, science fiction movies that portray uh, humans in the future, or, or Borg, if you will, show that we've uh, progressed to a point, or maybe regre- um, maybe not regress, but either way, um, you end up with uh, interchangeable body parts where they're all mechanical. But what I'm thinking is more where they're uh, not mechanical. They're actually biological. So, you know, if you lose a finger, you can just pop on another finger. Or uh, even even more so, if it's not about an injury or so, it, it could be just like a change of clothes where you say, well, I need a different kind of hand today for whatever reason. I'll just swap that one out. And it won't be mechanical, maybe be biological, or you could have a choice. That could be the other side of it, too. Be careful oh, wow. who you swap your body parts with. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is oddly like one of my four questions today. So when you say interchangeable and, and, and these become modular, so it's, it's, not that you're ch- it's not like I now have a leg for an arm, an arm for a leg. You're saying, Bill over here has got an arm. I just smashed mine. Bill, can I borrow yours? You don't need it right now. That kind of interchangeability. Uh, yeah, we could go with that. I mean, the All possibilities right. are obviously endless, but, um, yeah, I mean, you could get into really, uh, twisted concepts of it where you switch a hand out for a foot or whatever, but I'm thinking more, uh, practical, logical kind of applications for it. Uh, but you know, all technology gets perverted at one time or another, right? So, <laughs> you know, right. Even in the future. Yes. I like it. I mean, borrowing somebody's, you know, I don't know, their better hand cause they're a surgeon or some other thing. It seems like not a terrible idea. It seems like it'd be okay. Well, you know, some people have really amazing hand-eye coordination, and obviously some people don't. So you could uh, swap out maybe a set of eyes and hands for a particular task or whatever. But isn't but that in the brain? Does it get, taking the eyes and hands actually give you their coordination? Hmm, interesting. I never really thought about it like that, but yeah. Uh, but uh, what, I wasn't necessarily thinking where you would trade it with somebody else, but you would have a set of your own, just right. like uh, Steve Jobs had, you know, six black sweaters or whatever the case was. You could just grab, you know, one of six arms for Wednesday and you have to do a certain task. And well, that arm is maybe suited a little more for uh, uh, strenuous muscular activity. Right. I don't right. know. Anything like that. Yeah. Or if sprinting you need to, legs uh, versus distance was, legs, stuff like that. Yeah, I was yeah. just going to say that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. If you need to run a marathon, you can strap on the marathon legs. Something like that. Do these do eyes think- match my tie? Uh, <laughs> do the tie match? Does the tie match the eyes? Yeah. That was a line cut out of Minority Report, by the way. (laughs) 
Uh, what, so let's you, let's throw it over to, to Eric. What do you think of uh, this 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 way of dealing with um, you know limb loss or even enhancing ourselves? What's what's your idea of that future? So what if you could mix non-human parts with humans? So if I wanted cheetah legs or something that I could attach, you know, four cheetah legs to my stomach, and then you know run a couple hundred kilometers, um, that would be that cheating in a be. marathon. <laughs> I immediately think of like Dragon Con and Comic Con and all the people that have like tails. And I'm just like, they just be real tails now. Well, that's true. Think of what it would do for the cosplay industry, the oh, booming yeah. cosplay industry, right? Like, no, you don't have to wear those crazy stilts anymore. Your legs are these, you know, backwards Our crazy facing, stilts, yeah. Right. Exactly. I want. I wonder if there'd be issues with like hot swappable body parts where the first generations of them would be really buggy and then that you'd have to reboot yourself somehow because, uh, I don't know, it didn't register your new arm. Right, right. Uh, I, I'd, I'd, I'd love to borrow your legs, Scott, but uh, I just don't have the drivers. And, uh, mm, yeah, exactly. Got a work. USB drive. We can probably go downtown, get it on the library computer. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, you know, I, I, the, the movie... Oh shoot! The um, the one with the, what's her name in it? Boy, that's really narrowing it down. I can't Julia Roberts. The, no, that's the other one. <laughs> Sandra. Bullock. Anyway, blonde. She looks like my mom Reese when she was growing up. No, <laughs> I can't remember <laughs> I the movie. Anyway, it's based on that MTV Liquid Television uh, cartoon. Oh, uh, Eon Flux. That movie. Oh, yeah. oh, Eon Flux. She's in not that movie, in the movie. No, 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 no. Well, no, she's actually yeah. you're right. She's brunette as heck in that movie. But anyway, uh, she, her, she like not her, mom. but somebody in that movie has feet for, or, uh, excuse me, hands for legs. I don't know if you anyone. Oh, terrible. right. Yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. That movie's horrible. But the, but the hands for legs thing is really interesting because essentially they gain the ability that, you know, apes sort of have this one real great strength over us, which is they can kind of use their feet as we use hands and they can use their hands in the same way. And that guy or girl, I can't remember which, I think it was a girl, could just leap and do stuff and was acrobatic as all craziness and everybody could do parkour if they wanted. I mean, that, see, those kinds of augmentations where we rethink the location of certain body parts, I like, I like that idea a lot. So I think we can take Chris's idea and, you know, move it into the absurd a little bit. It's so crazy. Mom looks like though. Charlize Theron? Yeah, a little bit growing up. That's why I can't watch Charlize Theron movies and enjoy her on the same level most red-blooded American men do. I see her and go, ah, oh, it's my mom. I, I have Eon Flux on HD DVD. <sighs> oh, my gosh, really? It was one of the free ones you got when you bought your Xbox HD DVD drive. That's I'm great. I'm glad it was free. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was all free until <laughs> I watched it. Actually, it was well, for a horrible movie. It wasn't that bad. Yeah. But you'll never get that time back. Yeah, you, you can't, can you? That's, that should be a crazy-ass prediction. Some way to, Should we get all our time back? Yeah, and maybe that's that goes to your uh, restore, your your archive. Do you, do you yeah. watch a bad movie? Yeah, just, or just like, nope, restore point. Can I go back yeah. before I watch that movie? All, all those World of Warcraft it. players are really happy to hear this news that that's yeah. coming. Yeah. The all only right. downside is you'll have forgotten that you watched the movie, and then you'll probably right. just watch it again. You have to leave a note to yourself <laughs> in the past. Yeah, somehow, oh, no. and then that breaks the time stream. Yeah. Then we're all screwed. Well, let's uh, let's get to four questions, shall we? Four questions? Gosh dang it, Tom. Let me tell you about what those are. This is four questions that we ask our guests. We each do it. We do it in turn. We do it rapid fire style, and they are not allowed to think about it too much. They have to answer from the gut. I will start by asking my questions of Chris. Chris, are you sitting comfortably, sir? Uh, somewhat, yes. All right. Good enough for me. What fictional president of the United States would you like to see serve as an actual president of the United States? Hmm. Um, Do you know enough fictional presidents of the United States, Chris? It can be movies, could be the Independence Day. Dude. Morgan Freeman is an acceptable Morgan answer. I, I, yeah. I know, I did want to say him. He was the easy one, right? Yeah, uh, okay, yeah, right. Morgan Freeman. He's kind of like one anyway, so we'll give it to Morgan Freeman. I remember the day with, I became the president. Yeah, yes. you could totally do that. Uh, but he'd always wander off and talk about, like, penguins and stuff. We don't want that. All right, <laughs> next up. If you could replace, see, here's that question. If you could replace your left arm with any other object, what would that object be? Um, iPhone. <laughs> it's already <laughs> there anyways, right? So You wouldn't be able to, like, reach your, oh, well, I guess if you did your hand, you could. But if you, did, if you just had it, just tell it to, and then my right arm would take care of the rest. I don't know. Okay. Like that. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> awesome. I saw somebody, by the way, uh, an amputee went and, and pur purposely got a dolphin tattoo because the shape of where their amputee is, <laughs> it sounds a little morbid, but it's not. It was really cool. This really detailed, super hyper-realistic looking dolphin out coming out the side of this guy it was awesome. Anyway. Uh, what you got, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Do what you got with, with, with what you got. Um, if you could, oh, I did that one. Did I miss one? Oh, you yeah, skipped I skipped your second question, yeah. That's right. I'll do that as third. If one TV network were to buy up all the TV networks in the world and make one giant mega network, which network do you hope that would that would be or who that would be? Uh, tech TV? I don't know. I, I don't watch TV. <laughs> Not so anymore. I really care less. If they all yeah. go away, that would be all right. All right. Uh, another acceptable answer is Taco Bell, since we know that happens anyway. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, last, last question. Where do you prefer your super virus to come from? Apes, bad meat, or aliens? Good question. Oh, aliens. I asked the hard questions, Tom. No, so the rest no, uh, no hesitation. Aliens, there. It would be more interesting coming from another planet. Yeah. Although you could argue maybe it did come from the other planet or another planet with all of the options there. Right. And the other two are just miserable. It's like, oh, right. apes did it. Oh, we should have killed them off years ago. Well, okay, bad meat did it. Well, you <laughs> shouldn't hate the, the apes. Meat? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can't really do much about aliens. They just show up and that's it, right? Uh, right. Aliens bringing what, what us their they... bad ape meat <laughs> <laughs> infected us all. Oh. It's called Taco Bell. <laughs> right. Active, active and Taco served Bell. it in Taco Bell tacos. Uh, all right. Uh, we'll move over to four questions for you. Eric, are you sitting comfortably, sir? Yes, sir. Good. Then we'll begin. Question number one. What sports will be popular in 1,000 years? Crochet. Team crochet or individual? Uh, it'll be like synchronized crochet. Synchronized crochet. Wow. Gotta yeah, go, yeah, boys. Yeah. The synchronized crochet match is starting. Oh, man. <laughs> Let me see you at the sports bar with my needles in hand. Ah, good. Good one. Question number two. Will we ever get to the point where machines make everything and we make art? Why can't the machines make art? So we won't even... We, what what do we do in. then? No, nothing. It would just be like that, uh, what was that movie, Idiocracy? Idiocracy. just sit around doing nothing. That's what's going to happen. Sad. Okay. Question number three. Where in the solar system will we find life first? Outside of Earth, of course. Um, hmm. I'd, Venus, just because it sounds cool. All right. Everybody <laughs> thinks it's too hot, but no. You're, not, you're just not mm. looking hard enough. Uh, I think we'll find life in the, in the solar system. Yeah. Uh, question number four, how long will the concept of nations survive? Um, probably forever, though I think that nations may get smaller and smaller. So oh, okay. uh, the, this idea of these massive countries will probably eventually go away and going back to more of a kind of uh, like a tribal system where we just have these smaller nation states uh, that are self-governing. More community-oriented identification. Yeah. yeah. I like I that. think so. Cool. Excellent. Well, those are your four questions. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, this was a great show. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we're at the end of it, uh, but sadly we are. Eric, uh, let folks know uh, where they can find other stuff you do online and, and, and what that stuff is. Sure. Um, well, I guess my stuff is right down there at the bottom, ericportalance.com. Um, also, check out my podcast called Attention Surplus. It's at attentionsurplus.ca. We record that every week. And for those on the audio, it's uh, Eric, E-R-I-C, Portalance, P-O-R-T-E-L-A-N-C-E.com. Thank you, Eric. Right. Chris. Uh, Thank you. Let folks know about uh, the things that you're doing and where they can find you on the web. Okay. Uh, well, the best place to find things out about me personally is uh, chrisluckhart.com. And, well, you got Motion Blur Studios up there on the lower third, but that's that's okay, too. Uh, there's nothing on that domain right now, so chrisluckhart.com is the best place to go. And uh, hopefully tomorrow I'll be launching my own little podcast network at uh, motionblurmedia.ca. All right. So, so those are the two places. Luckhart, also uh, L-U-C-K-H-I-A-R-D-T. Yes, yeah. Thanks, everybody, uh, for joining us. Scott Johnson, thank you, as always, for hosting along with us. Yeah, and I will see you this weekend, yeah, I believe, yeah, in I Anaheim, will. sunny Anaheim, California. We'll be there for BlizzCon. A reminder to listeners, if you are going to be at BlizzCon, find us, shake our hands, say hi. Will you be doing any instancery there? I believe so. We're going to do, do an episode on Saturday, but we don't know where and what. Will it, whether it will be in front of people, whether the instance will be a private affair in some sort of hotel room. 
We don't know, but I know at least two of the three of us will be there. Uh, myself and uh, Terpster, the British man, no one can seem to get enough of. And uh, really looking forward to it. It's going to be a good time. And I'm really looking uh, forward to seeing you. I haven't seen you since June in the flesh. I know. It's been too long. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking forward to it as well. Yeah. Folks, uh, you can find us online at forecastpodcast.com. Uh, that's our blog. Go leave some comments there. Or you can send us an email with your own predictions. We might even read them on the show. We read them all in person, though. Forecastpodcast at gmail.com is that address. That's it for this episode of Forecast. We'll see you later, folks. Bye. It's only 32 years away. Way. 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 Way.